Very good. So this is now the second uh, lecture. It is dealing with resources and it's a very, very important part of um, sustainable development. Now look at this slide. It's picked up from a book by John McNeil. He published in year 2000. He is a historian living in Washington, D.C. And he was sort of tired of all the complaints from the environmentalists and said that this is not any worse than it always has been. So he was going to write a book called Nothing New Under the Sun. So he started to do the research and he changed his point of view very radically after this research. He found out that global population over the last 100 years, 1900 to 2000 then, last century, increased four times. The global economy increased 14 times. Industrial production increased 40 times. And they did use... Lars, we see it in a bill. We see it in a bill. We see it in a bill. We see it in the first side. As the first time. Oh shit, then we have to start again. This is the phase also. Jag förstår inte varför det händer. Ser ni en bild nu då? Nu är det bättre. Okej, okay, då ska jag gå baklänges här då. Aha. Ja. Okej, okay, I have to start talking. The global population during last century increased four times. Global economy 14 times, industrial production 40 times, and it reduced 16 times. It's very close to economy, by the way. Carbon dioxide emissions increased 17 times, also like energy use. No oh, shit, it doesn't work this one. Oh, no, here it comes. Sulfur dioxide emissions 13 times. You see this? Mm -hmm. oh, very good. Okay. Ocean fishing, fishing 35 times. Uh, now, nine times. It, you know, it is an um, indicator of meat eating in the world, if you wish. And forests decreased 20%. Um, agriculture increased two times, twice as much during these 100 years. While some were suffering, for example, blue whales, only a quarter of a percent survived after these hundred years. Mm -hmm. And you can see this, this is just an example of what we call exponential growth. That is increased resource use, population, water use, etc. You see on these curves. Um, and notice that curves are concave. That is, it's an exponential growth. It means that you have a constant, more or less percentage If you have a percentage wise increase, you can say that uh, it's exponential growth. For example, uh, if it's a 2% yearly increase, it means that double after 35 years. You take 70 and you divide by the yearly percent too. It means that it's four times after 70 years, eight times after 100 years, and so on. In, and of course, this cannot go on, on a, um, you know, final world, if you wish. It is called the Great Acceleration. And here you see just a section of similar curves. There are very many more you can, you can, uh, you know, to find Great Acceleration on your computers, and you'll find hundreds of curves like this. The great acceleration when it comes to resource consumption started seriously in the 1950s and went up. It's been all since long, but uh, it's seriously very high increase from the 1950s up to 95 in particular. So um, this is so serious that people started to talk that we are living in a new geological era, 
which is called the Anthropocene, when human impact on the world is the dominating force. We are behaving like we were in a geological force. It's, so we live in the Anthropocene. I will uh, say a few comments about resources and start with the non-renewable resources. These non-renewable are resources mined from the earth, from the crust of the earth. And of course they are slowly emptied uh, because they are final, non-renewable. But it's the environmental consequences of this mining and the accumulation of the end product is often more serious long before the resource is emptied. And of course you have two kinds. You have the fossil fuels mined from the earth, coal, oil, and gas. This is the scale you see of mining of the island, if you wish, in Germany, some years back, of course, but it's still going on. And most of these uh, fossil resources are used to produce electricity in power plants. This is the largest power plant in Poland, Belchato. They have nine reactors here producing electricity, burning lignite, the lignite is on the been there the way. They are environmentally, uh, they have an environmental um, certification, which is sort of ridiculous thinking about their use of lignite. Um, this is uh, the global direct primary energy consumption, energy, and you see is more than 85% which relies on fossils. So you have coal, it's the gray area here. You have oil and you have gas, the three types of fossil resources. When it comes to biofuel, which is the um, traditional one, wood, of course 1800 was only that. Now it's just a few percent. And up here you have the modern fuels, uh, nuclear, wind power, etc. You see fossils is very dominating. Of course, fossils are non-renewable, so they will end at some point. And here you see various <clears throat> ways to depict what will happen modeling here. When is the peak oil happening? Well, the, the yellow one is the uh, data, actual data, and it depends on what you include in oil. There are all kinds of various ways to do this. In one simple way, the peak oil happened in 2005. And in other um, ways to calculate, it's still down. But at some point, of course, it will end we will have an end of the oil age at some point. So um, we have in, when it comes to sustainability, we have to think beyond oil and fossil fuels. It's important to say. And of course, this effort to go beyond oil age is going on everywhere. It's going on in the building sector, in the transport sector and so on with various forms of new energy sources especially important because of climate change caused by the burning of fossil fuels. So here you see outside Los Angeles, people like driving their own car, using uh, you know, gasoline or whatever, diesel. And of course, this is impossible to continue like that. It has to end somehow. Well, the other part of non-renewable resources we are talking about is um, metals. And one important metal is, of course, iron used for steel, etc. This is the largest iron ore in the world. It's in northern Sweden, Kiruna. It, there, there are, of course, uh, consequences of this, but not serious and rather local. So uh, it's not so much a concern. But there is a concern when it comes to some other metals, either because there are um, toxic or because they are rare. So when it comes to the new type of metals we are mining, 
Uh, it's called the rare, rare earth metals. It's used in modern technologies like, for example, in batteries, in hybrid electric motors, generators, in wind turbines, and so on. You see neodymium, prosodium, dysprosium, and so on. They are used because of their very extreme magnetic properties in particular. Um, you can see on this schedule, you have the, the metals that are formed in the rock and are present in big amounts, for example, iron. And they have a number of intermediate here. You find copper, zinc, nickel, and so on. And then you have the rare earth metals here, like neodymium, gadolinium, samarium, dysprosium, and so on. Um, and then you have very unusual metals. You have a gold and you have silver, for example. So um, this is an interesting thing to look at. And you, you can know that these rare, rare earth metals, they are not so rare. You will find them on very many places. Uh, for example, lithium, which you have here, is used for lithium batteries. It's not so rare. It's possible to, to actually mine and use. And, but now the problem is that practically all rare earth metals are mined and exported from China. So the rest of the world becomes very dependent on China. Uh, from the beginning, it wasn't like that. But uh, now it is. From the beginning, the uh, United States was an important source of rare earth, met rare earth metals. But of course, China sells them more cheaply. So that's why it's becoming so, mm -hmm. so dominant. Now we start to look for mining rare earth metals in Sweden. Perhaps you can do it also in Uzbekistan. I don't know. Uh, when it comes to metals, we have to look at recycling. To, because metals are not destroyed. There are elements that are not destroyed. They can be used in any number of times, which is very different from fossil fuels, which are burned and they, you know, they end up as end products like carbon dioxide. But uh, for example, when it comes to recycling of iron, it's very established. Steel is today produced mostly from scrap, scrap iron, not virgin metal because it's simply cheaper. Copper is recycled. And of course, collecting copper and used it for new uses, it's, um, it's a good economy. Mm -hmm. Lead recycling is requested by law, at least here in Western Europe, because lead is poisonous in the environment and you have to be very careful in recycling it. Mercury is a special case because it's, it could be replaced. You don't have to use it. Mercury is now large scale use in chlorine production. It doesn't need to be like that. There are other methods. So mercury is taken out of the resource flow and stored in, uh, you know, in old mines and so on to get rid of it. And of course, when it comes to rare earth metal, recycling exists, but on a low scale. So it has to be improved very much. Okay, so much for non-renewable resources. We now look at renewable resources. And uh, these renewable resources are renewed, but they be harvested faster than they are renewed, reproduced. So also renewable resources can in fact be emptied. We'll see some examples of that. And I will start with fisheries. Fish and fishing, it's a typical renewable resource. But of course, fisheries are too large. This, this is, I hope it will work now. It's a small film, in fact. So, so this is fisheries over the world. And you see the red area uh, on the map and you see the year on the left. This is when peak fish happen. In the red area, the amount of fishing catched in the ocean has decreased from that year. So now it's 95, 90s, 98, 99. Now we start again, have a look again now. We start in the 50s and peak 
blackfish happened around us here in England, the North countries first, and then it's going like that. We passed peak fish long time ago in the 1990s in the world as a whole. This is a uh, very scary example. It's the Atlantic construct. It was outside Newfoundland. There was an enormous amount of cod. You could, catch, you could catch cod very easily, a big cod. It was enough to send you in a basket down in the sea and then take it up and you had some cod in the basket. So it was extremely rich. And of course, commercial fi fishing started to increase that very, very much. Scientists told the government in Canada, we found in this part of Canada, to uh, limit cod fishing. But, uh, you know, the fish is a very enough. And of course, they were more and more successful in finding that cod. So they were catching it everywhere, even on the reproduction areas. So in 1992, there was a collapse of the cod population outside Newfoundland. And from practically from one day to the next, there was no more cod. So the whole business around COD was lost. About 40,000 people lost jobs on vessels, in, uh, you know, in fish factories, uh, in stores, etc. So it was a total collapse. And this is now 30 years ago, and there is still not re-establishment of the COD population outside Newfoundland. So this is an example of how it can how it can end if you are overusing a renewable resource. What we have today is rather um, fish that is from aquaculture production. That is, they are grown you know, in big, big areas in, for example, Norwegian coast and so on. So it's, uh, that's what we have. You see it's uh, global agriculture production is the light uh, blue area here. You have other re renewable resources that need to be maintained in some good way. Forests, I mentioned already last year, uh, last week that it's an important resource that needs to be taken care of properly. Um, soil, people don't think too much about that, but the way agriculture is conducted nowadays means that topsoil is diminishing. It is, you know, plowed very deeply, 30 or 40 centimeters. It comes into contact with air and it's uh, the organic content is being oxidized and when oxide goes to the atmosphere and the amount of topsoil is decreasing is decreasing 100 times quicker than it's re-established. Topsoil can also be for, formed because of, you know, uh, the, um, whatever is growing on the topsoil is actually turned into new topsoil if it's done properly. So to, on some places, this is being taken care of. But uh, especially in Uzbekistan, where you have a lot of agriculture important, you have to look at this soil. Is soil Decreasing or increasing is important. And water, of course. We will talk much about water uh, in this course, but water is also a resource that could be emptied or mismanaged in various ways. So far about renewable resources. These have been studied in some very important uh, projects. The limits to growth projects, Meadows et al. from 1972, I mentioned a week, a week ago, and it needs to be um, discussed again. Uh, I will come back to it. The ecological footprint networks was, this was an approach that was started in the 1990s by Ries and Wattenagel in, in uh, Switzerland. We'll come back to that also. The material flows, uh, study in Wuppertal. Wuppertal is an important institute in, uh, in Germany. Um, it was led by Schmidt Blick, Bio Schmidt Blick. Um, 
and we'll come back to that as well. The socio-ecological principle for a sustainable society, I mentioned last year, uh, last a week, um, it is the natural step foundation that picked up this. And then we have the planetary boundaries uh, approach that was started by Stockholm Resilience Center. We'll come back to that as well. But these five different ways to look at the management of global resources you need to know and keep track of. We start by looking at the limits to growth. You know, it's very special because this publication, the original one, was released on March 2nd, 1972. So today it's 50 year celebration of this publication of this study, the limits to growth. It's 50 year on the day, in fact. And uh, it has been a very important publication. It was translated into 37 languages. It was sold in 12 million copies. It was widely discussed, especially among economists. And of course, economists said, there is no limits to growth. We can continue to grow forever, to grow forever. That was their approach. But uh, that is not true. Just disregarded the long term drawbacks. It seems to be part of human nature, you know. You like to you, you like to enjoy what you can find in the short term and you simply disregard what is looming in the long term. So this is it. And of course, what we are looking at these curves, it is um, um, I'll see here, the Club of Rome report. They warmed for the fact that if you have an exponential growth of resource use against the natural limits, it's a finite system, the planet is a finite system, it will not end up well. It, they also pointed out ways that we could deal with this. That is, we should... Uh, limit our resource use and try to be in balance with the capacity of the planet to, to, to um, produce the resources. By as I mentioned, was very, especially by economists. In fact, the first well-known um, um, agreement that economists said, yes, there are limits to growth. It was published in the Wall Street Journal in 2001, I believe. So it took almost 30 years before they admitted there are um, limits to growth. Yes, and the study was has been validated several times. In 1991, it happened. In 2003, it happened. And since then, there have been some, you know, small, uh, other follow-ups. I just read the uh, statement of Dennis Meadows. He was the uh, leader of the research group that produced this report uh, 50 years ago. He's 80. He was then, you know, 30. Very young um, researcher to lead such an important study. And he says that as far as one can see, we are still on the track of the so a normal uh, development that they produced. It's this one, it's the basic scenario. We are still on it, in fact. And they use that they um, use this uh, system called system dynamics to produce these models. It's a lot of statistics coming here. And try to get these um, models internal, that is, all, all the parameters were part of the model, which is different from what the IPCC do now, because they have several parameters are outside. They are influencing the result. Here they are part of the model itself. So it's different, one should try to remember. And as far as we know today, this peak, overshoot peak, will happen around 2040. But of course, it is not one simple year. It's different for different resources, and it will, uh, you know, drag out over time. 
but we will see a downfall as far as we understand right now. We have to reduce our resource use. Yes, but this resource management, it can be improved and just say this very, very simple um, way to see it. The resource is extracted, it's used for production and something is produced and this, is, this product is consumed and after consumption becomes waste. This is a linear flow of resources. It is not sustainable. Linear flow of resources. It goes from resource waste. That is the, you know, the culture we have been living in and quite much still living in. We need to go from waste to resource. That is recycling, it's very important part of sustainable resource use. You can also formulate it very simple, like the three R, reduce, reuse, recycle. We have to reduce our resource use. When there is a, a end of one use of a resource, because perhaps we can use it for something else. And if we can't use it for something else, we have to recycle it. Or we can also, of course, include recover in this, reduce, reuse, recycle and recover. That is how we should see on resource in our societies. It is what we call circular economy, which we will come back to. So we need perfect recycling to live on this planet, which is resource production use end of life. And then after the end of life, the resource goes back to production. And it's very much possible if we really want to do it. It's interesting to point to this approach. It's called cradle to cradle. Products Innovation Institute. And it's developed in two parallel places. My, Michel Brangat, he was working in Hamburg. He's still in Hamburg. I met him several, several times. And William Bill McDonough in San Francisco. I do not know him, but anyhow, they produced together this institute, which they called Cradle to Cradle Product Innovation Institute. And companies could get certified from the, this institute. And when I looked at it for some time back, there were 500 companies, companies who were credited according to C C to to Cradle. So it is possible. Now there is some uh, efforts to do this on a legal basis. That is, some companies are legally required to take back their products. Then, when they are uh, have been used up, they have to take back their products and somehow turn it into resources. So this exists. For example, when it comes to mobile telephones, just to take one example, well, very many different things companies have to take back. Okay, so that is my first half. And now we should um, use um, 30 minutes for other things. The first 10 minutes, you should discuss what has been happening during these 30 minutes, which I told you. Discuss how you use resources yourself, how you can improve it. Do you buy the waste? Do you collect waste? Do you sort waste? And so on. And after, well, 10 minutes, it should be after 10 minutes. Of 10 minutes is sincere. After 10 minutes, we should discuss again. So now it's 11.05. We started five minutes late. So in 11.15 our time, it's, uh, what is it, your time is not 3.15, isn't it? So <laughs> we should meet again. So thank you for uh, so much. And we go to the next part of the lecture. Do you see my new slide? It says quantification of resource flows. Yes. Very good. Yes, we okay. So that, that's what we're going to deal mm -hmm. with now. And uh, the first important concept here that you need to know is the ecological rugsack. 
And this means that all the material resources that is not in the end product. Uh, in the end product, it's about 5% of the resources. So 95% is in the ecological rucksack. For example, some, some 30 tons of nature is used to create one ton of car. And that in, then water is not counted in. For many industrial goods, the ratio is very similar. And it's also for services, remember. For example, ICT, communication technology, the cost for one message on the internet is equal, according to this calculation is some years back, so perhaps it's a little less now, is equal to that of producing four aluminum cans for beer. And then you need to know aluminum is very expensive to produce. Mm -hmm. Another way to see this is called life cycle assessment. Uh, and then we are dealing with material intensities. So the material intensities can be used for calculating life cycle assessment for many products. It means all the materials being, you know, used for producing a certain product. Um, so th this is um, a rather complicated and uh, something that you need to be studying quite much to be able to do, but life cycle assessment is there and it's being used widely. For example, uh, how is it? Is it better to use a plastic bottle for Coca-Cola or is it better to use a glass bottle for Coca-Cola and reuse it many times? This is a question for life, life cycle assessment, one of the first, in fact. And it turned out that you have to recycle the glass bottle for Coca-Cola 11 times before you had the same life cycle assessment of material intensity as you have for 11 plastic bottles. This is the kind of things you can study. The ecological rug sec, as I mentioned, is that part of the life cycle assessment, which is not in the product. And there's also the concept of MIPS. It's material input for a certain service. Material input pro unit of service, MIPS. For example, how much material has to be used to travel from point A to pay point B, for example. How much material is to go with a car or a bicycle or whatever, a train from one point to another one kilometer away. Those things can be calculated and those ends up in MIPS. And to do all these things, you need to have tables of material intensities. And they are today available on big databases, which you can find on the internet. And using that, if you have know how, how to do it, you can calculate life cycle assessment. So this is a very, very important tool to deal with material intensities. Another way to do it, which is simpler, and it is also simple to explain to people, you need, don't need to be an engineer to do it. It's about ecological footprints. And it was uh, developed by William Rees in 1990s. The ecological footprint is the surface area a population needs to continually certify its needs and produce its products and services. Um, I will soon show what it is, but now um, how much is there um, on the planet that can be used for services and products? Well, it's called uh, global hectares. And there is about 1.8 global hectares per capita on the planet. Presently, it's actually decreasing. So perhaps it's, today is only at 1.7. The ecological, ecological footprints is a concept that is used quite widely in society. It's used by the general public, the companies, authorities, and so on. And it's a quantitative, it's a quantitative information. Um, so we'll, you see, you can go to this 
footprintnetwork.org to, to learn more about it. I just show some what are the components of a footprint. You see here, you see on the, <clears throat> I have to move this a little. You have forest products. You have a carbon footprint, that's mostly energy. You have cropland, that is mostly food. You have bit, built up land that is mostly for, uh, you know, infrastructure. And then you have fisheries. So this is what is included in the food. And it's, here is also explained a little, food, fiber, timber footprint, cropland, forest grazing, then fishing ground and so on. And then the energy footprint, of course, it's fossil fuels, wood, nuclear, hydro, and so forth, built up land. Um, so it is, there are routines for how to calculate the number of hectares for a certain number of kilowatt hours, for example. So this is possible and it's possible to calculate the number of hectares for your eating habits every day or for your, the size of your flat. There are routines for all that. And that is shown in this um, uh, footprintnetwork.org, how you do that. And they do it for the whole world, they do it for individual countries and so on. And this is some overview for the, um, for the world from 1960 to up to today, in not quite today, 2008. So you see what is increasing in the footprint is in particular the energy, the top one, the blue dark uh, part of the footprint. And also, also the cropland, you know, the production of food is increasing quite much. While for example, fishing is not changing so much, forest is not changing so much. So, and you see there is an overshoot since about 1970, there is an overshoot. You know, it's part of this um, uh, global overshoot we have talked about, for example, in the limits to growth. Um, so the world biocapacity, as I mentioned, is about 1.8 hectares, global hectares per capita. And it can be translated into, uh, you, you divide whatever you're using with that number. And if it's one, you have the, you are on the world biocapacity point. And if you are more than 1.8, you end up in an overshoot. Here you see that the same trends continue up to today. So this is data up including 2017. So you see the energy use is increasing dramatically. More and more fossil fuels are actually included here. <laughs> and here overshoot. And here is called ecological deficit. It's the red area. So since about 1970, we are using more resources every year than there is available on the planet. It's an overshoot. So you see it's increasing all the time. The last few years here, it has been a little less perhaps. We are becoming a little more efficient, but this is a serious overshoot. And that is from the um, ecological footprint, um, um, you know, uh, footprint work in, uh, in Switzerland, they produced a, uh, some more data. Here you see the in high income countries uses the more, more resources, they have a higher footprint. And low income countries, of course, have a lower footprint, they're using less resources. And then you see in some particular areas here, you see the, the yellow one is low income, the red one is Chinese. This is only to 2010. I didn't find later data here. And then, of course, the biocapacity is reduced. It's going down all the time because we are becoming more and more people and we are destroying our planet a little. They are publishing every year a date when the global 
resource capacity was passed, used up. Last year, 2021, it was July 29 on the global scale. I also find out of various countries. So in Uzbekistan, it was October 20, and in Sweden, it was April 6. So see, we, we are using up our resources of the planet in only three months almost. But in Uzbekistan, it's close to 10 months. So it's very different. The year before in 2020, it was about August 20. So it has been much worse in just one year. So you see here the global biocapacity per person in 2017, it's 1.66. Uh, 50 years earlier, it was 1.8. So it's decreasing quite much. So it's not so nice looking when it comes to overuse of resources. Global Earth overshoot day, July 29, last year. We will see what it will be this year, 2022. It's possible to calculate your private footprint quite easily. It's not so uh, good calculations. There are a lot of uncertainties here, but at least you get an idea. And you also, in particular, you get an idea what part of your footprint is the most important. So here I have references to several footprint calculators. You can look up yourself. You see footprintcalculator.org, for example. It's a footprint network itself who is producing this. And then WWF is having one. It's called footprintwwf.org. This one is from England, but of course you, you have it also for other countries. And then the Earth Day Network is another one who produced the footprint calculator, you see it here. So you, I suggest that you go in and simply calculate your own footprint and see how much it is. And then you can use that calculation for see how you can improve it. It's a typical exercise to find out how to improve it. Well, now we leave this calculation and go to have a look at how we can improve resource management. There are many ways to resource efficiencies. It's very important to say. Many examples have been produced from various sources. I look at this Gunter Pauli, he's a very interesting person. He's from Brazil, in fact, but he has worked in many countries. And he uh, established the Ziri Foundation, Zero envir Environmental Resource Impact. So he is also the Club of Rome member, you know, the one who produced the um, uh, Limits to Growth uh, study. Uh, he was actually running a master course in Torino in Italy, and he took all his master students from various places, especially to Africa, to work on innovations to produce good products without inducing too much resources. So if Everyone should do as he suggests. Uh, there should be a much better resource use. And he wrote a book about this uh, some 10, 15 years ago. Another one is the Factor 5 study. It was very much a, 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 a result of what was studied at the Wuppertal Institute in Germany, which I mentioned. This fact, Factor 5 is quite a big book. In fact, I have it in my bookshelf. They explain how to produce the train using five times less resources, how to produce a car with five, five times less resources, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's quite technical. And uh, you, you can read a little about it on the Wuppertal Institute uh, homepage. But it's, uh, it is just showing that if we want, we can improve resource efficiency very much. Uh, they used this so-called Natural Edge project for showing what has happened over the last 250 years or so. So you see, and they talk about the waves of innovation. The first one, of course, was very simple water power, 
the use of iron, uh, the production of textiles and so on. The second wave was steam power, establishment of railroads, uh, production of steel, production of cotton. Now we are in the middle of the 19th century. The third wave we thought of talking about electricity use, you know, they were possible to, to uh, um, uh, establish generators to produce electricity. The chemistry was improved very much, so it's possible to produce a, a lot of um, organic chemicals for various purposes. Uh, of course, also the um, internal combustion engine, the normal car, motor cars, was produced here. And then we come to the fourth whale. Now we are into the mid 1950s and 1900s. You have electronics, you have aviation, you started the space age. And of course, much better um, uh, chemistry. The fifth wave, now we are around year 2000. You have the digital uh, revolution with di digital networks, internet and so on. You have biotechnology using DNA and so on. You have the information technology. This is the fifth wave. And now we are into the sixth wave. This is about sustainability. We have radically improved resource productivity. We look at whole systems design. So we know how things are connected. We can do green chemistry. That is chemistry which doesn't produce uh, in, in uh, pollutants. We can look at industrial ecology, which you, you will learn more about in the coming lectures green nanotechnology and so on. So that's where we are today. So look at how um, the innovation uh, development is important for improved resource management. Of course, we can comment on a few things. Cleaner production, for example. Cleaner production means a much better production, which is improving the production of products. And of course, cleaner production is good, not only for the environment, but also for the economy. You make products efficiently, not pollutants inefficiently. This, of course, requires some um, competence and the course in itself, in fact. We will look at a few uh, other things at the end of this lecture. The first one is the pl planetary boundary concept. The planetary boundary was uh, a project that was published in 2009 for the same time, talking about the stable operating space for humanity. How can we find a, the limit for how much resources we can use? This has to do with the planetary boundaries. These planetary boundaries, we could not transgress without uh, you know, risk of destroying the planet and our own society. This was a big, big project between Sweden and Australia in particular, and it was, you know, described like this. They were able to identify nine planetary boundaries. Uh, of course, you have climate, which we'll talk much about, ozone depletion, which has been rather uh, successful uh, part of it. You have uh, aerosols into the atmosphere. You have acidification into the marine environment. Fresh water use, important for you in Uzbekistan. Biodiversity loss and so on is also part of this. Chemical pollution is part of it. Here you see it more in another picture again. You see the red parts, it's where we have passed the safe zone of the planetary boundary. For example, biodiversity is very seriously reduced now. It's almost a thousand times quicker uh, destruction of biodiversity than it was naturally. So it's serious, very serious. We are into a new phase of 
biodiversity collapse, so to speak. And of course, climate for sure, you see the stratospheric ozone depletion is a good example because we were up here and now going back. So we are into safe area. But when it comes to things like biogeochemistry, that is particular nitrogen phosphorus, it's too big uh, flows of these. Many people think that freshwater use will be the next area where we will pass our planetary boundary. This is uh, uh, the most recent publication from them about how to um, identify and how to quantify all these planetary boundaries. You can look at it this in this publication from 2015. It's about the same uh, four areas that are seriously changed. Another way to look at this, another way to look at this is uh, what's called donut. And it was, uh, um, you know, it, it was uh, introduced by a British con economist, Kate Rayworth. This woman had, you know, the background in economy, but also in social sciences. And she uh, suggested that we could look at the planet planetary boundaries in this way, that we are living in a donut, you know. Donut is a big piece of bakery, which has a hole in the middle. And then on the outside, you have the planetary boundaries, chemical pollution, fresh water withdrawal, biodiversity loss, etc. You have all that outside, climate change and so on. But on the inside, you should have what's needed for us as a society to live. We need water, we need food, we need good health, we need education, we need income, we need peace, we need political voice, we need social equity, gender equity, and so on and so on. All that is needed. It's a social foundation of a sustainable society. So uh, the area between uh, the planetary boundaries and the social foundation is called the safe and just space for humanity. That is where we should live. We should respect, uh, you know, the resource economy of the planet, and we should respect the social needs of all the people. We should have a regenerative and distributive economy, recycling economy, if you wish. It's often called recycling economy. And, re, you know, respecting recycling, in all these ways, we will have a sustainable society. Thank you. That was the end of my lecture. And now we should remember you that the for each uh, part of this course, there is a lecture, but there are also some reading to do. So these two chapters from the book that we produced within the um, um, Water project together with uh, you in Uzbekistan. Uh, those two chapters are, are the reading course for this particular site. <clears throat> and then, of course, we have the third component of the course is the student seminars. And we will have a student seminar in just one hour. I will be with you in Samarkand. And I trust you have prepared three student seminars. Three students have prepared seminars. And of course, there is uh, corresponding in Nukus, and there is should be the same in Tashkent, but it that doesn't look like too promising right now. And uh, in Urgenj and Izik, as it should also be. Okay, so. Um,